Please turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. And then if you would, place a marker in Daniel chapter 1. Don't you love how the Lord works things out when we don't even know what he's doing? Let me explain what I mean. We are today in week five of a series called Real Fruit. We're in the middle of a series talking about what Paul refers to as the fruit of the Spirit. And in Galatians 5, Paul lists the things that we should see develop in our lives as we spend time with God. Well, obviously, on a day like today, celebrating our one-year birthday, we want to be able to look back on what we've done and look back and, and remember this year and then look forward to the future. So about a month ago, I knew that we were going to be in this series, and I knew that this was going to be our one-year anniversary, and I didn't know how to resolve that dilemma. So I began to sit down and look at the fruits of the Spirit and see what we were going to be talking about this week if we just stayed in the series and didn't take a break from it. And here's what I found. We're going to look very quickly at Galatians 5, 22 through the first part of 24. I'm going to be reading from the New International Version. I'm going to remind you what the fruits of the Spirit are. Paul says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And so far, we have talked about love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, and gentleness. We've got two fruits left in the series, and today we're talking about faithfulness. I don't know about you, but I love Christmas. And it's not just because when that's when we get to celebrate our Savior's birth. I love all of Christmas. I love the Christmas music, which I usually start listening to around the 1st of November. I love the lights. I love that the weather's cool. I love Santa Claus. I love the reindeer. I love the Christmas tree. I love the whole thing. We even have a Lionel train that was my dad's when he was a little boy, and we put it around our tree. I do the whole Christmas thing. It's awesome. But I really like giving gifts. And there was this one year, I remember, Justin did this this thing, and it was the cutest thing. He was younger than he is now. This wasn't like last year. But Every present that Justin opened, he would get so excited and he would say, are you kidding me? And I don't think he even realized he was doing it, but as a parent, that was the coolest thing in the world to see your kid open their presents and instead of being like, all right, next, everyone was, are you kidding me? That's how I felt when I found out that today on our one-year birthday, we were going to be talking about faithfulness. Are you kidding me? That's perfect. It couldn't be any more perfect. And the reason I get so excited is because faithfulness is the reason we're here today. Faithfulness is the reason that Centerpoint Church exists and that it's going to exist well into the future. I'm talking about the faithfulness of Faye Hutchison and the Arkansas District of the Assemblies of God, who in 1961 bought a little piece of property on the corner corner of Honeysuckle and Monroe in Lowell, Arkansas, for $1,000. And then seven years later, they sold that little piece of property to Lowell Assembly of God. I'm talking about the faithfulness of a long line of pastors at Lowell Assembly of God that included Daryl Rogers and Don Evans and Randy Brown and lots of other pastors whose names I don't even know. I'm talking about the faithfulness of the members of that church who for 50 years poured their blood, sweat, and tears into building something and reaching people in Lowell, Arkansas. I'm talking about the faithfulness of church secretaries and Sunday school teachers, and Royal Ranger commanders, and missionette leaders, and worship leaders. I'm talking about the faithfulness of Jonathan Watson, our sectional presbyter, and the current leadership of the Arkansas District of the Assemblies of God, who made a choice nearly two years ago to take a chance on a somewhat young, inexperienced pastor 
who believed that if we sold that property and started a new church in Lowell, it would give us a better opportunity to reach more people. I'm talking about the faithfulness of 42 people who were on our launch team, who worked diligently to turn an office building into a church, and who told all of their friends about this new church and invited them to come. And I'm talking about the faithfulness of each one of you who choose to come back week after week, giving your time, your talents, and your treasure. Volunteering in the nursery or in children's church or serving on the worship team or the hospitality team or the tech team. Working to build something and to serve our community and to love people. We are here because of faithfulness. So what is faithfulness? Rick Renner is an author and a speaker and a minister, and he also is a guy who happens to know a whole lot about the Greek language. Rick Renner is the guy that makes me sound smart when I get up here and tell you what the Greek word really means when I've never spoken a day of Greek in my whole life. If you're ever looking for a daily devotional book, I recommend Rick Renner's books called Sparkling Gems from the Greek. Every day he pulls out a little gem, a little nugget, if you will, and explains what the Greek words mean that are translated into English in the New Testament. In one of those books, Rick tells us about the word that is translated here as faithfulness. The word is pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S. Pistis. Renner tells us that that's a word that can be translated many, many different ways. It can, it can refer to faith, as in faith in God, or faith in an outcome, for example. But he tells us that specifically in this instance, in the way it is used here, that it conveys the idea of a person who is faithful, reliable, loyal, and steadfast. He says it pictures a person who is devoted, trustworthy, dependable, dedicated, constant, and unwavering. Let me read those words for you again. Devoted, trustworthy, dependable, dedicated, constant, and unwavering. Aren't those all words that we would love to be used to describe us? I remember when Christina and I stepped out of our prior ministry positions. Our former church did a phenomenal job showing us honor as we were leaving. In fact, they probably gave us more honor than was due. Well, me anyways. Christina, no. She deserved all the honor she got, but they gave me way more than I deserved. But they made a video as we were leaving, and they interviewed several of our former students who had been in our youth ministry. And they ask them each to use three words to describe us. And I won't tell you all of those words, but I came across that video on my computer last week. And here's a few of the words that were used to describe us. Powerful, loving, outgoing, encouraging, caring, impatient, and loud. I'm guessing that the last two were about Christina. Those words are good, most of them. But if I had a choice, I really think I would rather be described when I left as devoted, trustworthy, dependable, dedicated, constant, and unwavering. Now, I could have just come up here today and given you the definition of faithfulness and then prayed and said, let's go to the park. Everybody's like, why didn't you? I wanted, though, to actually give you a real-life example of what faithfulness looks like and to teach you a little bit about faithfulness. So I began to search the Word of God and look for men and women who were faithful. And as I'm sure you can imagine, there were many. There were so many men and women in the Bible that I could have chosen to talk about today, but I finally decided to talk about Daniel. 
Hopefully you placed a marker in Daniel chapter 1 when I told you to. But if not, go ahead and turn there now. And as you do, I want to give you some background on Daniel. Daniel was an Israelite during the time that King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came and conquered Israel. He lived in Israel. And the Bible tells us that King Nebi, which is what we're going to call him from now on, took all the cool kids back to Babylon with him. It says that he took the young men without any physical defect who were handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed and quick to understand. He took all the cool kids back to Babylon, and his goal was to teach them the Babylonian language and literature and then put him into service in the palace. It's really a pretty smart idea if you're a conquering king. Why kill them if you can take them home and use them? Daniel was one of those men who he took back to Babylon. And in Daniel chapter 1, we read what happened when Daniel got there. Verse 5 tells us that the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. That was pretty cool of King Nebi to say, look, you guys are the best of Israel, I'm going to bring you home, and I'm going to feed you like a king. I'm going to treat you like a king, and I'm going to train you, and then you're going to help me lead. The only problem was, at least for Daniel, that much of the food that the king wanted to give him was against the law that God had given the Israelites of what they were and were not allowed to eat. So beginning in verse 8, we see Daniel's response to the situation. Does anyone's Bible have a title or a caption above that section of Scripture? Right above verse 8, do you know what my Bible says? Daniel's faithfulness. Daniel's faithfulness. So today what I want us to do is Look at this episode from Daniel's life. And I want to point out three things that are always true about faithfulness. Verse 8 says, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. He asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. The first thing that is always true about faithfulness is faithfulness always begins with a decision. Faithfulness doesn't just happen. It doesn't just occur. You don't just wake up one day and realize you have been faithful. It doesn't matter if you're talking about faithfulness in your marriage or faithfulness to a diet, faithfulness in your walk with God or faithfulness to the church, to your friends, or to your job. Faithfulness requires a decision. It begins when we choose to commit to something. And in reality, that decision needs to be made in advance. I can promise you that if Daniel had waited until he was sitting at the king's table, staring at that food to make the decision, it would have been a lot more difficult for him to resolve not to defile himself. And anyone who's ever been on a diet said, amen. When I was a youth pastor, I used to tell our students that when it came to sexual purity, they needed to decide in advance what their boundaries were. Because when you're sitting in that dark room watching a movie and that boy puts his arm around you or that girl snuggles up to your chest, it's a lot more difficult to make that decision. And the same thing goes for our spiritual lives. If we're going to be devoted, trustworthy, dependable, dedicated, constant, and unwavering, we need to make that decision in advance. We're much less likely to read the Bible every day and to resolve to do so at 5.30 a.m. when the alarm goes off. That's not a good time to resolve. 
We're much less likely to resolve to pay our tithes faithfully when we're looking at our bank account and we're paying our bills. We're much less likely to resolve to give up our time and volunteer at a ministry at the church when we've come off of a long work week and we're exhausted. We're much less likely to resolve not to miss church when we wake up on Sunday morning and the sun is shining and the fish or the hammock or the hiking or the football is calling our name. Faithfulness begins with a choice. And like Daniel did, we need to resolve ourselves to be faithful because it doesn't just happen. As the story goes on, Daniel proposes a test to the guard. He says, please don't make us eat this food. Instead, test us for 10 days. Give me and my three friends here nothing to eat but vegetables and nothing to drink but water. By the way, this is not a point of the sermon, but sometimes faithfulness looks crazy. He says, don't give us anything but vegetables and water. And then in 10 days, test us against the other men and see if we're not as good as they are. So they do the test, and in verse 15, we read that at the end of 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So it says the guard took away their choice food and gave them nothing but vegetables. Then in verse 17, we get to our second point. It says, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. Number two, God always honors faithfulness. All through scripture, we see this time and time again. Abraham was faithful to God to the point of nearly sacrificing his own son. And God was faithful to give him not only that son, but to make him the father of a nation. Moses was faithful to lead God's people out of Egypt. And in spite of him messing up, God allowed him to see the promised land. He honored his faithfulness. David was faithful to the sheep in the field even after he was anointed king. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever noticed that when Samuel came to anoint David king, that the next story we read about David, the beginning of the story of David and Goliath, it says David was in the field with the sheep. David was faithful, and God not only made him king and not only protected his life, but he blessed his reign. Over and over and over in the Bible, people are faithful And God honors that faithfulness. And we've seen it over this past year as well. As you have been faithful, God has honored that faithfulness. We have seen relationships with the city, with City Hall, become fruitful. And and every time we go to City Hall now, they see us there. They're just thrilled to see us. And they're like, hey, won't you go back and visit with the mayor for a few minutes? I remember telling Christina before we ever planted the church that someday I wanted to be able to take cookies to City Hall and them just know who I was. Now, they don't just know who I am. They're inviting me to go to the mayor's office and talk to them. They're including us in the National Day of Prayer. They're talking to us about starting a city Bible study. We've seen those relationships with the elementary schools grow, specifically with Tucker Elementary. We've seen people over the past year be healed, some nearly raised from the dead. We've seen people give their lives to Christ and follow him in water baptism. I'll never forget one story from the first few months of our church. There was a a boy in children's church, a young man in our church, who had to write a paper at school about who he could ask, who he could go to if he needed something, if he had questions. And this little boy wrote in his paper, and he specifically named Beth Durgan and Miss Shea because of their faithfulness. And I can't wait to see what God does in the future 
with Center Point Church. I can't wait to see where he takes us because of your faithfulness. Because God always honors faithfulness. And as we continue to love and as we continue to serve and as we continue to give, I know that God is going to honor that. Verse 18 and 19 brings us to our final point today. It says, at the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, in other words, at the end of the three years, the chief official presented them to King Nebi. The king talked with them and found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. The king found none equal. The final point about faithfulness today is that faithfulness is always noticed by those around us. And there's no story that I can think of better to illustrate this than the meeting that I had with Miss Viola this week. On Wednesday, I had a meeting scheduled with Miss Viola. She's the principal of Tucker Elementary to talk to her about the Great Gift Exchange and how we wanted to bring their school into the Great Gift Exchange and bring 20 to 30 of their students out and bless them with gifts, give them a Christmas if they might not otherwise get one. And when I showed up for that meeting, Miss Viola came out to greet me and was so excited to see me. And the first thing that she told me was, you'll never believe this. She said, the other day, I was walking down the hallway, and I saw Grace Pullen's grandmother. That's how she referred to her. And, she, and, and Patsy, is who she was talking about, had volunteered many times at that school in the library over the years that Grace attended school there. So when she saw her, she said, oh, are, are you here to help out in the library? And Patsy said, no, 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 I go to Center Point Church now, and I'm here to help a kindergarten class. And Miss Viola said, I am so, so thankful for your church's faithfulness to serve this school. And as we sat there and had our meeting, I was facing the window, and about halfway through our meeting, here comes Beth walking into the school wearing a center point t-shirt. And I said, look, that's, that's Beth Durgan. And she stopped again and said, Pastor Brian, you just don't understand what it means to us that you guys serve here. She said, I think you've got three or four ladies that are coming up here all different times during the week. And then she said, by the way, do you know what else you could do for us? You see, here's the thing. The reason it's important that faithfulness is always noticed by those around us isn't so that we get a pat on the back. It isn't so that we're rewarded in any way. It's so that it opens doors for us to do more. Do you understand that in 2018, an elementary school in Lowell, Arkansas has literally thrown its doors wide open to our church because of your faithfulness. Faithfulness always begins with a decision. God always honors faithfulness. And faithfulness is always noticed by those around us. It's funny when you search the Bible for the word faithfulness. Did you know that it's very rarely used to describe people? More than 90% of the uses of the word faithfulness in the Bible are used to describe God. Psalms over and over says, great is your faithfulness. Your love is never ending and great is your faithfulness. 
see, the fruit of the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit because it's what's in God's nature. And the more time we spend with God, the more his nature comes out in us.